I'll go over a little bit about myself, everybody. Uh, you can call me Smokey. I was an infantryman in the United States Army from 2005 till about 2011, or December 2011, sorry. Uh, during that time, I served for three years and did two deployments to Iraq with the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, I was a Bradley driver, Bradley gunner, and uh, ultimately for a short while, Bradley commander toward the end of my, uh, my time in service with 1st Cavalry Division. <clears throat> I think my favorite position on it would probably be uh, the gunner or the Bradley. That's just the most fun for me. You know, it's uh, the 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannon is quite a machine, to put it put it lightly. Um, and uh, we, we can go ahead and uh, play the first video, if you could, Erland, and I'll uh, go over what the Bradley is. Um, so the Bradley Fighting Vehicle is a tracked infantry fighting vehicle, or IFV for short, that was produced by BAE Systems for use by the U.S. Army in response to the Soviet BMP program. <clears throat> um, it's been in service with the United States Army since 1981, when it was fielded as a replacement for the M113. Uh, it was named after General Omar Bradley, who was the commanding general of the U.S. Army during World War II. Uh, it's an immensely powerful and deadly weapons platform. The armament uh, on the Bradley includes the M242 25mm Bushmaster chain gun. Uh, that is its primary weapon. It shoots both 25mm high explosive and 25mm armor piercing rounds that you can switch with the flip of a switch while engaging the enemy which is awesome. Uh, it also has an M240 Charlie, which is a machine gun var variant that is 7.62 millimeter. And it also has uh, one of uh, everybody's favorites, the tow missile launcher. Um, here in this video, you can see uh, this is an infamous video. It's one of my favorites, I think, from, uh, from the war so far, where uh, group of Bradleys rolls up on a brand, uh, the most powerful and uh, current tank in the Russian army arsenal being the T-90M. Um, you can see this video, there's a lot going on here. You can see in the top right corner of it, there's uh, definitely another Bradley fighting vehicle that is engaging targets on the ground at range. Uh, but we're paying more closer attention here to what's going on now. I think in the bottom right-hand corner of the video, you can see the Bradley engaging a T-90 off to the left there. <clears throat> um, so there's actually two Bradleys in this, vi in this video. And they're in what it's kind of set up. They set, it, they set up in what's kind of referred to as an L-shaped ambush. So that means that they can uh, pretty much have free reign to open fire on that T-90. Um, to where they're not risking engaging each other with uh with their 25 so they're just able to zero in on that uh t90 there you can see the t90 deploys some smoke uh probably to try to conceal itself from the bradleys uh they don't have too much luck with it because what happens is the, these two bradleys just kind of go at this t90 uh hitting it with withering 25 millimeter fire uh all over it and uh it does look like here that they're just using HE, which is interesting. And, you know, I don't know the reason for that. That could be they might have already gone through all of their AP rounds. Uh, there could have been an issue in the turret or something. They couldn't engage with AP for whatever reason. But um, the fact that a 40-year-old American IFV was able to take out the most current uh, main battle tank of the Russian army, to me, is incredibly impressive um so yeah, okay they're, I, they're engaging i i have a question I'm sorry i have a question on, on this so it, it's engaging with he but why isn't it uh engaging with the tow missile against the tank when that's kind of the main armament against yeah. tanks normally that's a great question erland and um the reason here is because uh it takes a while to deploy the launcher that uh, takes about, you know, over 20 seconds. And then the biggest reason is in order to fire the tow missile, the vehicle has to be stationary. So um, the tow is uh, optically and or an optical and wire guided missile. So there's a wire that is attached to the physical missile itself. So when it is launched from the Bradley turret, it stays attached to it through that wire. Um, so you have to keep the Bradley stationary to keep it connected to the wire. If you move too much, uh, you know, you risk detaching that and then it's going to go wherever it goes. It's not going to stay on target, but, um, 
the toe is awesome. We're going to look at a video of the toe later as well. But so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's why they didn't engage with the toe missile here. Yeah, so I guess maybe because of of the close quarter, quarter combat situation in this case, it's uh, yes. too risky to stay stationary. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at that, uh, the Bradley is the Bradleys are constantly moving. You know, you're facing a a main battle tank with a hundred. You know, I forget their caliber, one hundred two millimeter cannon on it. If that thing hits you, it's going to hurt. Uh, you know, that, that, that could kill the vehicle, that could kill the crew. So you, you want to keep moving uh, when you're engaging. You know, if there were another Bradley that were to roll up while it was preoccupied with those two, it could have engaged it with the tow. But these guys did a good job on staying moving, making sure that that uh, main battle tank could not hit them. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and then um, <clears throat> so uh, we can go here so sorry um yeah we can go to the sh uh shorter video of that the t90 best i think that will be a better illustration here on um it's just a little bit more of a condensed video that shows the capabilities of it you can see the bradley's operating a little bit better on them this one yes sir yeah so you can see the uh on this video, you have the Russian flag there. That's noting how close it is to the T-90 there when it rolls up on it. And you can see the Bradley kind of moves away, does the right thing. It's engaging it as it's moving. Um, you know, it's hitting it right in the turret, which... And then you can see also that uh, the T-90 engages back with its main gun, which is, why, again, why they keep moving. You know, here here's the uh, end result is, you know, I'm not sure what happened here. Uh, the crew could be panicking. It could have... Obviously, the uh, repeated impact of the 25 millimeter damaged the vehicle or damaged that T90 quite a bit. Um, here, uh, this is great. You know, another thing in the war, another obviously <clears throat> very uh, emerging technology on the modern battlefield is FPV drones. Uh, and you can see right there, an FPV drone kind of finishes off this T90. Uh, I believe the T90s are crewed by three people. You can see uh, all three of them run out. Uh, you know, they're not moving too well, and I would assume after the multiple concussive uh, or explosive blast from that 25 millimeter, those guys are probably pretty rattled. Um, so moving on here, um, it, the Bradley, again, it has a wide array of impressive offensive capabilities, but the true strength of the Bradley is in its defensive capabilities and it, especially its armor. Uh, the Bradley is an incredible, incredibly survivable vehicle. Um, that means it takes a lot to kill it. It's going to take a lot more to uh, to injure the crew, or you know, you know, hurt the crew in the vehicle. Uh, it's unlike you know Russian vehicles like BMPs, where a couple well placed rounds with, with you know something like a twenty five millimeter is going to kill the vehicle. But uh, we could go ahead and roll that third video, Erland, if you could. Yeah, yeah I, I anticipated it. Awesome, so already. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, you can see right here, that is a Bradley getting hit. Um, it's smoking. It's obviously damaged. But the remarkable thing here, you know, again, here's another hit. looks like probably an ATGM there, or that's a anti-tank guided missile, and another one. And the cr this crew in this Bradley is able to evacuate um, the vehicle coming up here. So you could see here, this is a, you know, an overhead view with the drone, the area they're engaging in. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. And uh, another Bradley comes to the rescue here. <clears throat> you notice it pulls up, it starts engaging. That 25 millimeters going really hard. They drop the ramp, and they start getting to work on getting the guys out of there. You, have, you see them. Oh, and then that Bradley gets hit as well. So, And he is so blasting that three. full with the chain gun at the same time, uh, yep. even still after getting hit. Yeah, he didn't stop. They didn't I, stop. You see there. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna play that all again. Three of the guys I, get in too. I'm gonna play it again. The moment he pulls up, it's ex excellent, isn't it? The the execution. It is. It really is. You know, there's that that impact right there. They don't stop hitting it. You know, the last two of the crew get in, and then uh, they start moving, which is perfect. That's exactly what you want to do. You want to get the hell out of there. Um, so they, they keep engaging with the 25 and they get the guys out. That's incredible. You know, you see 
what that initial Bradley got hit with, you know, it got hit by multiple ATGMs, RPG maybe, uh, it looked like it hit a mine in the, in the beginning, you know, it, it, and for the crew to move under their own power and get out is just incredible. Um, you see, unfortunately, <clears throat> they had to abandon it and probably was destroyed after that. Um, and that's one of the major reasons why I think the United States needs to get off the pot here and get the Ukrainian army way more Bradley fighting vehicles. Uh, you could see during these videos we're showing you is the impact or the impact that they're having. You know, uh, Russia has IFVs as well. That's true, but they don't have anything that could withstand what the Bradley can withstand. They don't have anything that has that range of firepower with the advanced optics, with the advanced uh, or with, you know, <clears throat> the reliability and survivability of it. It's just something that they don't have. And I'll go on record here saying that the Bradley fighting vehicle, uh, it's my opinion and borderline objective fact that the Bradley fighting vehicle is probably the most prolific killer on the battlefield as far as IFVs go on either side. Um, <clears throat> another great thing, uh, we can go on to the next video, Erland, is the tow missile. I had a lot of people ask me about the tow missile. And here we see an excellent video of a tow engagement. You can see, I think it's a Russian T-80 tank coming up on a Bradley fighting vehicle. Um, obviously, there's a friendly drone who has probably let the Bradley know that they're coming. Because as soon as that tank comes around the corner, they launch that tow missile and just direct hit on it. So, you know, that if you look at the distance there, that's an impressive range um, for it to hit it accurately. And tow missiles are devastating to uh russian armor so uh i look forward to seeing more videos of it this was the only one i could find or i think we could find of a tow missile engaging but i think that it's an incredible uh documentary piece of footage here just showing how uh how deadly the tow missile is as far as uh anti-tank weapon goes yeah um, and, and 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 these th they got quite a lot of different variants didn't they as well maybe john knows a little bit about this but didn't they get also like a top attack variant uh, oh god they've gotten every variant of toe under the sun they've gotten 2b arrow which is the most recent one that's a radio frequency command link instead of wire guided or instead of a wire command link and that's top attack with uh okay. tandem explosively formed penetrators and they've gotten a bunch of the older ones as well that's awesome john i didn't know uh Honestly, the variants of the toe I had in my personal experience, I I never got to fire one in real life. I've seen them used in real life, but um, yeah, I haven't much experience with them personally. I just know they're awesome. But uh, knowing all, that they all have a top the, attack. All of the really cool ones, I think, came into service after you got out of service, I think. Yeah, I, I got out, yeah, 2011 uh, was the last, uh, last year I was in, so it's been a while <laughs> it's weird that it's been that long honestly um <clears throat> so uh another uh i would like to get on to uh the next video here and, uh, this one's going to be a kazivac operation um sadly it's a reality of war people on both sides uh and that includes ukraine uh do get killed in action wounded in action here we see a Bradley pull up into position uh, while there are Russians advancing on their location and uh, they're evacuating some of their fallen comrades here. Uh, again, apologies about that, but uh, this is a fact of war. It's sad. And, uh, you know, hopefully we give them more of what they need so that we see a lot less of this. But anyway, the point here being in this video is the Russians are advancing on them pretty rapidly. They're able to load up um there's no audio here but you can hear um a 25 millimeter chain gun firing uh on the audio and then when uh here in a little bit it's going to cut to you know you can see the sparks there it's a uh, from flying uh, the rounds exiting the barrel uh it'll pan out here and you'll see the russians advancing on them as they are uh pulling away while engaging the enemy so and uh let me tell you when that ramps down and you're getting in and you're leaving or you know you're you're exfilling or infilling uh mounting or dismounting the vehicle and the 25 millimeters going off above your head it is really disorienting so i uh i give credit to those guys for doing it so fearlessly but yeah here you can see they're 
just pounding advancing Russians that are coming down the trench line here and looks like they got uh, got their mission accomplished. So um, another thing about the Bradley is that it's pretty quick for an armored vehicle that has top speed of about 40 miles an hour. So it's able to uh, move quickly. Um, again, this is another thing that they've been employing recently where uh, as I've seen a lot of videos lately of them utilizing the smoke grenades to offer some concealment to uh, themselves and dismounted infantry. And uh, <clears throat> that's a really good advantage. That's really good if uh, you are trying to uh, pick up the dismounts if they're under under contact, you know, or uh, CASI back operations, stuff like that. In the last video, you know, maybe they, they were out of smoke or something. I think I did see them smoke, throw a smoke grenade out the back, though. But um, the use of smoke has been refreshing to see lately. They're doing a really great job of using that. Yeah, that, that, that's, um, the first year, it was, you know, incredibly frustrating to see that they, it looked like, at least from our perspective, that they were trying to, you know, be careful about using it because they might, you know, the suspicion we have is that they were scared not to get new uh, rounds for their smoke uh, deployers. But the problem is if, if there is a re good reason to use smoke, uh, then you should use it even if you think you're going to run out because that might be the last time you will be able to deploy those smoke exactly grenades. yeah uh, if you're if you're in a situation you got to do it man you got to do it you know regardless of the scarcity later on you know like i mean it's not going to be a later on maybe if you don't use them that it's in, or in that situation you're absolutely right and i think you know in the beginning um you know going back to last year with um the counter-offensive that you know they've come a long way the ukrainian army has come a long way in using uh modern mechanized warfare and combined arms tactics you know they've uh well, about a year ago you know we saw videos of ukrainian columns where uh the vehicles were entirely too close together you know they're riding in a straight linear line through open fields into kill zones just one after the other that was tough to watch and thankfully I have not seen anything like that in quite some time. What I've seen, honestly, is uh, the Ukrainians adapting, uh, getting the real world experience on the web uh, or on the platform and in combined arms warfare um, that has led them to where they are now, where they are doing a hell of a job on implementing and uh, and fielding the Bradley. Um, <clears throat> you know, for all the Bradley strengths, too, another thing I want to touch on is uh the weaknesses which are thankfully very few but they are there um i think the chief witness or weakness on the bradley uh and all armored vehicles in the war today is probably fpv drones um they're really hard to hit you know if you get some like the lancet which are like flying broomsticks incredibly fast it's um you know i think that in general um that the introduction of drone warfare in this conflict is kind of akin to the introduction of tank warfare uh in world war one you know it's a new it's a new thing uh we're getting used to it we're learning countermeasures uh different you know electronic warfare jamming um or anti-drone systems like you know different launchers nets maybe i'm not sure but that is probably the chief weakness as far as a combat standpoint goes and the only other one and I can truly think of is the amount of maintenance that it requires to keep these things running and running smoothly. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience when I was deployed to Iraq, uh, every four, four to seven day rotation would be followed up by at least an eight hour day in the motor pool doing preventative maintenance checks and services, as well as repairs on the vehicle. You know, that includes checking fluids, adding fluids, uh, you know, working on the batteries, making sure they're filled with distilled water, changing air filters, uh, moving on to, you know, track pads to the actual track on the Bradley. Um, all kinds of different stuff you got to do to it. It's not even combat, you know, combat damage, just normal wear and tear. Um, and in order to do that, you need somewhere safe to work on the vehicle. So you need some sort of motor pool or something. I don't know how Ukraine's addressing that toward the front, but I'm assuming that they have something figured out where they can provide support to the vehicles and maintenance on a regular basis. You know, even at the zero line, even at the front, uh, they, they've got to have some sort of rotation where they're pulling vehicles to be maintained. You know, I mean, we, we have seen... Down cycle. 
Yeah, we have seen them, uh, you know, picking up uh, damaged Bradleys quite often and, mm -hmm. and pulling them back. Um, yeah. And I assume that they then proceed to load them on a truck and get them somewhere safe. But uh, yeah, salvaging a, a, an armored vehicle in the middle of a field, which is, you know, close to the front line is a risky operation and you need really specialized uh, vehicles to do that and a specially trained crew yep. as well. It, how is it to change like a track on on a Bradley? If you can, you mentioned it, and I think it's probably something you'll never forget if you've done it. Yeah, uh, well, that it depends. You know, they're, they're uh, ideally you're doing that back in the rear, where you know the track is worn out after use, and uh, you know you're back in your motor pool and you're safely changing the track, and that requires a, a quite a lot of people. Uh, we would have the entire or about half a platoon would help us do it because you have to move sections of track. Um, I can't tell you exactly how many off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I've done it, thankfully, because it's miserable. But, uh, you know, you got to carry, you know, I, I'd say it's about a hundred over 100 pounds. You got to carry multiple times, you know, 20, 30 times each person, you know, carrying sections of four of the track. And that's miserable. Uh, very, very difficult work, very labor intensive. Um, and then, you know, Apart from that, which I'm sure has happened, I haven't seen any videos of it, is when you throw track, you know, while you're operating, uh, when you're in combat, that is a very difficult situation <clears throat> to be in. Uh, it requires the work of pretty much the entire crew. Um, God willing, you have people covering you, you know, another Bradley, um, drones, dismounted infantry, while you work to get that track put back on the vehicle. Um, a lot of times you're doing it under fire. Uh, it's incredibly terrifying in real life when you're getting shot at and you're trying to get the track back on the Bradley. But, um, you know, you got to do what you got to do, try to get that vehicle moving again so you can get out of there. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> depends on where, it you know, where it breaks. A lot of times it'll just slip off the rollers and then you got to get an impact tool. You got to unbolt it, drag it, move it into place, get the track back on there and then apply grease to get the pistons back to the optimal, uh, tension level so that it doesn't happen again but yeah no the uh, throwing track in combat and throwing or you know changing track in the rear are two different things i would hate to do either of them but uh doing it in the rear would be the preferred method <laughs> yeah i understand okay uh, do you want to pr proceed to the next video yeah yeah absolutely where are we at now here um that's oh this is a great one this is a mtlb being engaged, I believe. Mm. Er. Yeah, let's see here. So Bradley's rolling up there. No, it's a okay. Yeah, discussion. no, they're engaging targets in the wood line here. So this is uh, my only complaint here is how lonely that Bradley is. It doesn't look like uh, I don't see another one, and that's probably due to honestly combat losses. They've lost quite a few of these vehicles. Um, so. Again, another reason for us to get get more of these. But if you notice, they're kind of shooting into the tree line, a slight elevation. And uh, it's my opinion there that they're doing that. So there's probably a uh, Russian fortification in there, like a trench, trench position. That's really common for them to do. And every wood line separating every field, they're setting up uh, defenses. So that Bradley shooting at that little bit of elevation where the rounds are impacting in the trees that what that's actually doing is creating kind of like an airburst effect, blowing it up over their heads so that that shrapnel is raining down on them in the trench, which <clears throat> that's, uh, you know, that's more dead Russians. That's more dead Katsaps. That's what we're, uh, you know, that's what it was built to do. You know, the Bradley was designed to fight Russians and the fact that it's doing that and doing so well at it is uh, it's great to see. I'm a little bit envious that I, I'm uh, not able to do it myself, honestly. But, uh, yeah, just e excellent use of uh, the mobile or the firepower on the Bradley here. And you can see there all the round casings on top of that Bradley is, uh, you know, they've been shooting that thing all day. So I'm, I'm guessing that this is like a, a, a real classical uh example of what the bradley should do which is supporting infantry because i assume if they are softening yes. up this target in the first place that means that, that someone is planning to move into that you know tree line absolutely you see that linear or the, that not linear the uh, tree line adjacent to it i bet you that uh there's probably ukrainian infantry in there that are ready to go in and mop it up 
Um, that depends. I mean, they're getting contact too by it looks like some sort of uh, maybe artillery or mortars going off there. Yeah, right there. So, you know, it's it's tough to say, but I would assume that there's got there's there's some sort of uh, infantry there that's about to move on that fortified position. Yeah, there's yeah that, that is uh, one of the main purposes of it. Uh, you know, and obviously also it's you know dual purpose tank killer too. But I mean, yeah, you see so supporting you infantry. See, you see the Bradley here. And there's yeah. artillery strikes here and here, and the whole field is littered with, with craters. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They've been trying to get, trying to maneuver on that for a while, I bet. Um, but yeah, there that's you see that a lot, you know. That's every field in Ukraine, I feel, and in you know, Donbass area looks similar to that. No. Uh, yep, yeah, I'll pull up the next video if you want to sure. go to the it's number eight. Yeah. Oh, here's another one. You see they're just laying down fire there uh, with the 25 millimeter. And you can see just the volume of it. You see the explosion there. You know, it's got a wide, or a pretty big kill radius on the 25 millimeter. You know, anything within a few meters of every one of those blasts definitely felt it. Uh, they're they're not going to fight anymore today. I can tell you that much. So that's a, another great video uh, showing the firepower of it, just, you know, pounding those Russian positions into submission, which is, you know, something we like to see. Uh, it's something I enjoy seeing anyway. But uh, they're, they're just doing a great job with it. And then here, um, oh, this is a good one. This uh, is from this one, I believe, is an MTLB, right? Yeah, and it's just outside of yep. Divka after Avdivka was... Uh, uh, when they pulled out, right? Yep. And you see the Bradley rolling up on it now. You see those Russians, know, they, it seems like they know it's coming. They dismounted really quick. They threw their weapons off it. This guy tries to run away. And, you know, it, this shows two things. First, the accuracy of the Bradley. You know, first round, second round, third round, every single round's hitting that vehicle. And secondly, uh, how shitty Russian vehicles are. You know, and I'm not saying that they're not deadly, but... You know, like just a few high explosive rounds completely killed this armored vehicle. Uh, and realistically, I think the first couple of rounds probably disabled it. But, you know, that's a great showcase as to the firepower uh, of the Bradley on an armored vehicle, which also illustrates the dual purpose nature of it um, being not just to support infantry, but also to kill Russian armor, which it does an excellent job of as, we, as we're seeing. Yeah. And you see the guy <laughs> saw the drone. They knew. They yeah. knew. <laughs> yeah, you watch these guys. The guy like throws his gun off. He just throws his weapon off to get off in time. So yeah, no, they they heard that the Bradley was coming. So you know, that's another big thing is that obviously these guys are scared of it. They know what's coming. They're trying to get away from it. And I'd be willing to venture that after that Bradley took out that MTLB, that it likely turned its attention on those dismounts and wiped them out too. But you, you you know you you can see the moment when the this guy he spots the drone. Yep, <laughs> he sees it, and that's when they oh, they really stop quickly there. Yeah, you know, he's not not even you know not they're not even stopped and they're jumping off. So they know something's coming. The guy just throws his gun. Yeah. <laughs> This is not how you want to dismount. And and this is a funny thing that we can see all the time that they're sitting on top of the vehicle, which is because they know that the, it's really badly protected and that you don't want to be inside a metal box and it's hit by, you know, something like this. Yeah, no, and, you know, I you see that a lot. And I think it's just, you know, um, I think part of it is, yes, they know it's they're not any better protected inside that vehicle, uh, you know, maybe from the from the initial round, but they know if they're sitting in there, uh they're not going to have a good time when that 25 millimeters ripping through it so but you know that that's one thing i think the other thing is that hopefully what we're starting to see um is maybe the starting that they don't have much equipment to ride in anymore so they're trying to cram as many people onto these things as possible so i mean obviously the russians aren't anywhere near out of equipment uh that is dwindling but they still have enough, but I think we're starting to see them try to be a little bit more conservative just out of a necessity to try to move infantry to assault positions and stuff like we're seeing here. Yeah, and I, I think another reason is also if you look at when they dismount, right, they the they don't have this large, large nicely uh, uh, 
um, opened and closed hatch, which is on the Bradley and one one three, the CV ninety. They all have a hi, hi, you know, is it a hydraulic uh, hatch? I think. Uh, or yeah. Is it a, yeah, it's a hydraulic hatch, and they open very quickly, and and they have a large uh, entry and exit. With, well, this one has very small doors. It's really difficult to go in and out from it. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why you see them riding on top, really. Yeah, they know that, that could they, be too. They don't have a lot of time. You know, between they jump off here, there's a few seconds, and then the, the M till B is, uh, is zeroed in. And, you know, they, it would have taken them another 30 seconds at least to dismount, maybe even a minute, because the the doors are really, really badly designed on MTLB and also on the BMB. Yeah, they. Yeah, I mean that that kind of goes with you know just the Russian way of war anyway. They don't really care about individual lives. You could see that in you know where meat waves and yellow charges at Ukrainian line or you know the Ukrainian lines. And I think you know they don't design their vehicles to protect the crew. They're just designing these things to move people from point A to point B and keep the crew a little bit protected so that they can move uh you know move people around they're not you know focused on dis you know the ease of mounting and dismounting because they don't truly care if they you know on an individual level if the soldiers or crew survive which is again a big difference between western ideologies and the russian way of war um, yep absolutely and then, uh yeah we could uh did you were you able to edit that last yep. video? So this is the fresh okay. video from yesterday or to, or a couple of days ago. I I first saw it today. Um, it was the first time I saw it uh, this morning here. But here, um, I can't. It looks like you know, are those BTRs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are BTRs. So you can see right there they got hit. They're getting hit with a twenty five millimeter uh, right as they come out there. Uh, looks like they're trying to deploy some smoke here to uh do the same thing that uh you see on the bradley they're trying to kind of conceal it but i don't think that's going to be too much help for them because one of the vehicles is disabled they have the sights trained on it already here it just looks like uh forgive my language here a clusterfuck i don't think they anybody knows what they're doing these guys why? are just running and hiding <laughs> i mean why are they you know dispersing in the middle of the field well it's because they got disabled right it's not because they want to yeah, be I there mean, no, no, no. But I mean, you know, they're just, you know, they're not all. They're, uh, they de they definitely don't want to be there. I could tell you that much. I mean, but, this uh, is this you know, is they're a... just running every which direction, though. You know, you see them running forward. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> this uh, is a horrible, get... horrible situation to be in. Absolutely horrible because you're in the middle of yeah, a field. It's like fish in a barrel. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide. I'll tell you that. No, I I don't think any of them survived this. To be honest no absolutely i i wouldn't think any of them did i think they probably shot and engaged with the 25 millimeter until they stopped moving and then probably sent you know some sort of reconnaissance to go go check it out but uh if you could see there the 25 millimeter rounds impacting in close proximity to that infantry um these guys looks like they were uh honestly probably just conscripts uh you know well unfortunately for them they probably didn't receive much training they're just kind of flying blind and uh yeah they didn't even know what you know what to do or what to react there and you know again it's, that is probably the worst possible position you would want to be in getting engaged like that and you know another thing to note is just how absolutely powerless they were um they were not able to engage at any rate back with the bradley's those btrs couldn't do anything they were offering you know no no they weren't offering protection they weren't offering cover and fire um they were disabled pretty pretty instantaneously and then that just gives the bradley and its crew free reign to just chew up that infantry with the 20 with the he rounds which are just absolutely devastating i could tell you on uh um when uh engaging humans with a 25 millimeter it's uh very devastating i again i would echo your sentiments i don't think any of those guys lived but uh yeah yeah, that is uh, that's about it for uh, my videos and um, the analysis that I had there. Um, I'm sure that there's plenty of people that have questions, and uh, at this time, I'd just love to field those questions. If you could uh, just ask away.
Yeah, so I guess first to the panel, if anyone on the panel has any questions you sit in with, and then we'll go to the comment section. And if, you know, for the people in the comments, then please, uh, you know, if you have questions for Smokey, uh, type away, and then we'll, we'll go, you know, we'll try and answer everything. Um, yeah, so first to the panel. A lot of questions covered by the chat and you guys, but um, I guess like, uh, have you heard anything about the Ukrainian infantry fighting vehicles, the ones they make, and like, uh, how do you think they rate or compare to to the Bradley? Um, what are they making? Are they making like their own variants of BMPs or? Yeah, it's like the BTR three, I think. Right? Is uh, John? Do you do you know? It's uh, the BTR four. It's BTR four, I think. Yeah, so it's not really. It's, it's I'm gonna say it's not directly comparable to Bradley because it's a. It's a wheeled AFV APC type thing derived from the BTR lineage, so it, it's pretty different. Yeah, I uh, I don't really have too much of an opinion on on their vehicles. I'm not. Uh, I'll, I'll be real with you, with Bradley. I'm more of a subject matter expert, but like uh, foreign or you know foreign to me armored vehicles, I don't know um very much about them other than the bradley is excellent at destroying them <laughs> as far as russians the russian equipment goes um there are plenty of awesome ifvs and i think uh ukraine is definitely capable of producing some of its own and i hope that their r&d department within their department of defense is looking closely at uh at this at this war and working on developing you know something that would suit their needs and the needs in the model battle modern battlefield in general but um, you know, as far as the B BTR four stuff like that, I don't know. Uh, I know the CB ninety is awesome. Um, the Martyr, uh, German Martyr, is probably pretty great too. I don't have a whole lot of experience with them though. But uh, I think you know, you know, I might be a little bit biased here, but in my opinion, I think the Bradley's the best out of what we've seen <laughs> in uh, in the Ukrainian conflict. The chat has a lot of questions. They want you to compare it to the CV90. So we'll see. We'll see how you do. Uh, I wish I could, guys. I really wish I could. I just, I am honestly not, uh, you know, I, I'm sure some of you guys uh, could have some things to contribute with that uh, as well. But as far as a comparison to the CV90, I haven't seen a whole lot of CV90 combat footage. And I think part of the reason behind that is that they received comparatively very, very few of them compared to what they did, the Bradleys or Martyrs. So um, I'd love to learn more about it, though. I can tell you that. Any of the panel have any questions before we go to the chat? Well, uh, what do you think about the Ukrainian camo patterns that they've been painting on them? I think they're pretty cool. Um, you know, I've seen uh, this looks like a pretty common variant, and I think that's probably pretty good. Uh, for the area they're operating in, you know, there is, you know, especially this time of year, um, I mean, there's a battle or the, the, you know, the area is pretty war torn and dreary, but there's a lot of green, a lot of forests and stuff that they're rolling through. So I think that um, looks like they're trying to do a little bit of like a digital pattern breakup too, which I think is interesting. And, uh, you know, they're also making use of, uh, you know, you can see on this, on this image here, like a, a ghillie suit type thing to kind of more obscure it, which, um, I don't know if that does anything for like IR, uh, probably not, but that's definitely going to obscure it from like, uh, you know, your typical aerial drone that might be looking at a faraway wood line where the Bradley's under some concealment and with that camouflage. Yeah, but th and this one doesn't have the ERE uh, on it. Though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was something I forgot to touch on too is the ERA, the explosive reactive armor. Um, you know, there, I've seen bradley's in ukraine that did not have it i've seen them with it and i could tell you you know that could be um just the needs of the individual units and how they prefer to operate you know if they need to prioritize speed and maneuverability they might opt for not using the explosive reactive armor um but because the explosive reactive armor is going to weigh down the vehicle significantly it's going to make it quite a bit slower. I think it'll cut down the top speed to about 30 miles an hour instead of 40. Um, it makes it easier, in my opinion, also to do things like throw track. So, you know, I think it they're, uh, you know, utilizing ERA kind of at the discretion or at unit level discretion is what it seems like to me. But uh, that's also ERA has a lot of advantages. That's definitely going to help survivability. That's going to help soak up things like RPGs, ATGMs, other 
types of explosive munitions that are hitting it. Um, but again, you know, if they're prioritizing speed, then um, they might opt not to use the ERA. Yeah. So how much does it actually impede uh, maneuverability since you said it's pretty heavy? Um, you know, you run the risk, like I said, it makes it easier to throw track on it. And when in a lot of the videos we're seeing, you know, you're seeing these uh, Bradleys going through open fields, through craters and rough terrain. So that's going to weigh it down a lot. You know, the ERA is going to weigh that down a lot more. So, you know, the terrain definitely has something to do with it as well. Yeah. This one has the ERA blocks on it, both, both on yep. the sides and on the front. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, very, like, lo very large compared to the, the Ukrainian ones. Yeah. Um, I forget what those ones are called. But yeah, these, I think, again, maybe I'm being a little bit biased. I would put this explosive reactive armor on before I would put, uh, you know, other ERA on. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I haven't looked up too much into it if that's like a NATO standard ERA that they're using, because I have seen videos where, you know, there's ERA on other stuff too. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's standard or not. Uh, also, the, the, I, I'm not sure if the DOD uses a standard filler between the Brat, the Bradley Army reactive armor tiles and what's on Abrams. But the exterior yeah. design is not standardized as far as as far as I'm aware, but they very well could be using the same filler. OK, right on. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate the insight there. I don't know too much about, you know, the nuts and bolts like that, like what's, uh, you know, what what explosives are in there or anything. I just. Uh, you know, the, you know, the most basic, <laughs> basic stuff about it, I guess, but. Uh, I'm not yep. super familiar with what the reference threat is uh, for BRAT um, relative to what the Soviets and the Russians put together with Contact 1 and Contact 5. I I'm pretty sure they had a bunch of different reference threats than we had, but that would be something I guess interesting to look at in the future. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a great profile picture of the Bradley there. You can see, uh, see it from the front. Uh, Look at the tracks, how the, <clears throat> it looks like those track pads are quite a bit worn, actually. You should probably change those, but, you know, that's the nature of it. Um, and that's the other thing, too, is you know, changing the track pads. That's something that takes, uh, uh, you got to do it often, you know, like a, when I was in Iraq, it was every couple of weeks in the summertime, we were changing the pads and then like once a month changing track on the Bradley, so. Maybe you can help me out uh, a little bit, Joseph, with uh, which questions to pull up. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll take a look. I think we there were a couple of questions comparing it to the Striker. Um, I, I guess like do, you you mentioned a couple of vehicles. Um, like what would we put in the category of the the type of jobs that Bradley does? What other vehicles would we put in that category? You mentioned uh, Martyrs, CB ninety. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So like Martyrs uh, or IFVs, they're you know I don't know much about them. They're different. They have like a much smaller turret. It looks like it's just a single occupier. Or single occupant turret on the martyr uh, the cb90 looks quite a bit bigger and i think they fulfill the same roles um ultimately you know they're infantry support and tank killers um i know a lot of them uh probably I'm, I'm guessing they probably have you know similar nato standard optics to use so uh yeah yeah, Erlen, do you have anything you want to say about the CB90 uh, compared to the Bradley? Uh, I know we, we talk we talk a lot about CB90s on the server, but I don't really <laughs> understand what's happening. Well, so, you know, the CB90, I'll try and pull up a picture while it's okay. It, it has a, a lower profile. Uh, I think the if not the engine is uh, not more powerful, it it certainly is uh, fa has faster acceleration uh, and a lower profile compared to the compared to the, the Bradley. And I, I think, you know, if they, the, if you want to, you know, kind of compare the design philosophies, uh, that I guess they want to be a little bit more nimble. You see that it has a lot more pointy armor here. It looks well. like it's lower to the ground too. Like a little well, bit. Uh, yeah. And I've seen the that both. cannon is way bigger. And I've seen them both next to each other uh, in real life. And the Bradley, even though if it's not a lot taller, it looks a lot, you know, it's it's a big, much bigger target for the uh, naked eye because it's a lot more boxy. So, you know, the, the philosophy is definitely that it wants to be a little bit more nimble and and, uh, and stealth. 
Uh, this one is the exact version that the Ukrainians got because the problem is if you want to compare the CV90 to the Bradley, uh, which CV90 do you want to compare to the Bradley? Because there are so many variants of the CV90. And that's sure. kind of the big difference between the CV90 and the Bradley. The Bradley does have, you know, you know, several different versions, but it but uh, CV90 has completely different setups. Like this one has a 40 millimeter uh, bow force cannon, which is, you know, incredibly powerful for a. Uh, yeah, a that day. sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, the the this cannon is insane. Uh, it, it it's there's no IFV that can compete with this cannon. Unfortunately, that's not going to be produced anymore. They're going to a 35 millimeter for the new ones. But uh, okay. interesting. I wonder why. I wonder why that is. Uh, it's a philosophy thing that like, most nations are going with a 35 millimeter. I think uh, the Dutch, the Danes, the Finns. Uh, we, we have a 30 millimeter chain gun on ours, uh, the Norwegian one. Um, so okay. the yeah, the 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 whole platform is a lot more, you know, uh, with the different iterations. Uh, but the one the Ukrainians got have got uh, is the the one with the 40 millimeter. Unfortunately, they didn't get the spike missile because Israel uh, blocked that. So this could be fitted with a spike missile, but they didn't because they weren't allowed to, which is a very sad thing for the Ukrainians because the spike missile is a really, really good alternative to the tow. Um, yeah. But uh, hopefully that will you know, be fixed. Uh, I'm, I think maybe it is, or they've fitted another anti-tank missile on the new ones that okay. Ukraine are getting because they are getting another 50 or so uh, newly produced. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Um, I wonder, I was going to say, I wonder if they're able to like Frankenstein uh, like a toe setup on there or something, you know, um, they've done, I know they've done some interesting things with, uh, you know, fitting J dams, uh, you know, gui or guided glide bombs onto their, um, uh, their fighter jets, you know, and I wonder, and, or the Franken Sams that we've seen, you know, like with the, so I'm, I'm wondering if they're able to do something like that, you know, across platforms. Um, I think that would be pretty cool. I mean, Saab does have ver you know various options if they want to put missiles on them. So, but the best yeah. alternative would be the spike one because it can be guided by a drone, which is very cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but the, we will see. Uh, they're getting the a completely new uh, um, uh, set of uh, CV90s at some point. I don't know exactly when. I hope soon. But uh, uh, the the problem is that basically all of Europe has ordered CV90 except Germany and, and the UK. So um, if they were to get them before this war is over, uh, because the, I think the line, the waiting line and the production line right now is probably something like 2030. So yeah. I hope that they managed to, you know, jump the line somehow and someone gave up their position in the in the order book because or else it's going to be way too much waiting time on those yeah that's you know that that's one thing that concerns me is you know i haven't looked too much into it you know the us uh biden has said that they're going to be sending a good amount more bradley fighting vehicles but you know my question is when you know they need them right now uh if they were to you know i forget the number i had it written down here like we sent 186 Bradleys to Ukraine and I would be willing to venture that they've lost a considerable amount of those I you know if we were able to send out of our stores and storage which hopefully they've been hard at work on refurbishing and getting ready for combat um you know I I would love to see like a tranche of 500 or more Bradleys sent because I think you know a number like 186 you know close to 200 that's enough to you know showcase or you know make a little bit of a an impact but sending out of you know the U the US has something like 4000 Bradleys between be the ones being operational and a couple thousand of them in storage you know if we could send a thousand of those that would change the tempo i i think it would truly change the tempo on the battlefield um as far as fighting on the ground is concerned uh you know adding that much more firepower um just in volume with the Bradley, I think would be a boon for Ukrainian defense right now. And even in you know, uh, remaining in a defensive posture, the Bradley is still very lethal. Um, 
you know, it's sights. I don't think I got into it too much, but you know, it's accurate range. You can shoot the 25 millimeter accurately up to almost two miles. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's an unbelievable distance. You can't see that far with the naked eye. You know, you, you could be engaging targets with the Bradley, which it looks like they have been. I've seen some very long shots. Um, you, you can engage targets that have absolutely no idea that what they're getting hit with and where they're getting hit from. So, you know, that's another huge benefit to the Bradley. And I'm sure other platforms like the CV90 as well is, you know, just the utility of having that kind of range on a, on an infantry support vehicle slash tank killer is just something else. Um, and, and I don't think Russia has anything remotely close to that as far as accuracy and uh, <clears throat> actual useful application goes. Um, so, but, you know, by the I way, you can, wrong in that, but... you can actually see the copper wires there. That's kind of cool. Yep. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. You can see them go out there and then you know, I, they'll probably drop here. I'm guessing. Yep. Oh, yeah. You can see them drop from the impact. So yeah, that's great. I didn't know. I didn't notice that in the first uh, iteration of that video, but yeah, you could totally see the tow wires. So that gives you an illustration of why, uh, why the vehicle needs to remain stationary when you're using the tow. Which yeah. it sounds to me like, you know, uh, you know, you got to keep in mind this, the tow missile is pretty old. <laughs> you know, th this is not modern technology. But the fact that this tech, you know, th this 40 year old platform is able to do things like take out Russia's most modern made battle tank uh, is impressive. And I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to. I know that the BAE just recently restarted production of the Bradley. Um, they are doing an A4 variant um, to as kind of like what it looks like a stopgap between that and the XM30, I think is the next um, IFV the US is coming out with. So that's going to be really cool to see. And I would love to see them, uh, you know, get some real life testing on the proving grounds in Eastern Ukraine right now with that, because those have what looks like way more uh, electronic warfare in anti-drone. And uh, if I remember correctly, an upgraded missile system, hopefully. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the thing that there, there's no other IFV than the CV-90 that actually have like anti-drone uh, systems embedded in the in the vehicle natively, yeah. and that you know that BAE is <clears throat> sorry that BAE is now. I think they're just upgrading or you know basically refurbishing old uh, hulls and and doing a total overhaul and, and adding some new systems. Because uh, I'm not yeah. sure if there's any new hull production, and I don't think they really need it either. But uh, that they're doing this now means that someone up in the system understood that this is something we need to address now can't wait to the xm30 project which they didn't even look like you know they, they haven't even chosen which vehicle it's going to be on the xm30 as far as i understand uh because i think they've got it uh i i think it's uh i think they got that decided on now i think they did okay um, but they're still not they're, I mean, they're not going to be getting to the first army units that or the XM30 until at least 2030, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's going to be some time before we see them, which is, I think, why they're um, getting yeah. the new Bradleys done as a stopgap. Yeah, then that's really good to see that they're actually reacting to this because, yeah, it's really, you know, it's a the Ukrainians are putting EW on them. They're doing all kinds of things to to protect against drones and operating as yeah. you know just a, a lone bradley instead of being you know in a pair or or a platoon because probably they want to avoid being detected as much as possible right and uh, i yeah. think that's part of it yeah i think uh, the other part again is scarcity um, sure I think they've lost quite a bit of them so that's because like ideally i think you, you want to have another bradley close by you know if you get hit or something you're going to want like in that video we watched earlier you're going to want one to be able to get there quickly um to be able to help you out but um there, there's another thing i'm noticing here there's a little box that's on the right side of the turret that it's called the civ that is the commander's individual no uh up on the turret up on the yep right there that's the commander's individual site 
And uh, what that is, is that is a site that's completely independent from the site that the gunner uses. Um, the commander of the Bradley can use that to look anywhere on the vehicle, or not on the vehicle, uh, anywhere in space. And they could uh, do stuff like target designate, where they could uh, you know, designate a target and the gun will go automatically to that target for the gunner to engage it, which is really cool. Um, and we had a lot of utility with that in Iraq, um, in asymmetrical warfare, like counterinsurgency operations, we got a lot of use out of the CIV and target designating like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, uh, the same kind of principle and or optic in principle as the gunner or as the gunner site it uses FLIR, um, uh, which is, I forget something, you know, type of IR. It's the green screen that you see on a lot of the videos where you see, um, the gunner engaging through the green screen. Um. But yeah, that's a, another great um, inclusion that makes the Bradley all that more, all that much more deadly. Yeah. So I've got a com like a question here in the back channels as well. Sure. Um, so we did touch, or you did touch into it a little bit, but um, in the beginning of the uh, summer offensive last year, which was an absolute disaster, right? We saw them yeah. move up in close columns together with um with heavy armor and these uh demining uh is it, what, what was it the uh, mine, mine rollers yeah mine scrapers they were scrapers right uh, yeah yeah and and they got stuck in the middle of the field and uh, they 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 were not dispersing they were really really tied together and basically yes. took out on, almost the entire column in one of the cases and in another more than half of the column and then yeah. since that, we haven't really seen anything like it. Um, what do you think they learned compared to, uh, you know, that first devastating uh, pictures that we saw? And how, what do you think about the, the development and in tactics? Because I think it's very fascinating. And we've seen them being doing something that looks like mobile defense when they were pulling out of a Divka as well, which mm -hmm. I was, think was very, very impressive. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, this is kind of like the story of life here, you know, um, in your life, you know, you go to college, you learn, you know, the basics of your career path. And then you figure out once you're done with learning in the classroom that 99 or 90 percent of what you're going to need to know is going to be learned on, on the job. Right. You know, that that goes the same for military training. You know, uh, I, I remember being a young private going through basic training and thinking, oh, man, I'm hot shit now. And when I got to my unit in, in Iraq, I was sorely mistaken. But, you know, that that is kind of, I think, what happened. It's just lack of real world experience. You know, they did all this stuff in a classroom. I think their training on it might have been a hodgepodge between, obviously, they're learning from NATO instructors. I know they did training on them in Germany, the UK, uh, and other countries, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, the training on training grounds is completely different in application than real world combat. You know, there's nothing that's going to replicate when you're in training, getting shot at by training rounds, the feeling that you have, uh, you know, the fear, the uh, anxiety, the you know, terror that you feel when you're getting shot at with live ammunition by people that actually want to kill you. So, you know, they had that unfortunate baptism by fire where we saw, like you said, like the entire column getting annihilated in a kill zone by their alligator helicopters you know they didn't have adequate uh you know anything to mitigate those <laughs> at all it seems like uh they had you know an artillery trained in on them atgms spgs you know any number of everything that they just hammered that column with and again you know there i think you know some of the training might have been a little bit by the old school uh old guard in the ukrainian military that would have you know kind of Put them in a position to bunch up get close you know survival in numbers maybe i i, I don't know their battle doctrine you know the old soviet way of battle doctrine i am not familiar with it you know but i think you could chalk up the losses that we saw in the initial part of the counteroffensive as inexperience um very poor command decisions on top of that and i think a little bit of nato allies kind of goading them into doing it because um, in my opinion, they should have probably just remained in a defensive posture. Um, I mean, and not... I mean, Solzhenyi was not, you know, uh, he was not happy with that. He 
didn't he yeah. basically said in his essay that doing that was never going to succeed if if you read between the lines and that yeah. means you know for some reason someone made that decision for him he had to go with it he's, he's not a politician he's a he was a military yep. commander and he has to obey orders and uh you know he he ordered that attack to take place and anyone that watched them you know start that offensive that understood a little bit about minefields and and kill zones uh oh god I, I forgot about, i didn't even mention the mines yeah yeah, yeah. i mean the, yeah. the the largest mine anti-vehicle and anti-personnel combined minefield uh we've ever had in europe right so uh, yeah and that's what i was saying you know from the get-go is you know the amount of ground that is just absolutely saturated with mines you know after you know it's, it's going to be sad after this conflict is over they're never going to stop demining ukraine it's there's yeah. going to be mines there forever but you know just the the saturation of mines that they employed there just you know yeah it, it was bad you know watching watching that hurt and i think that they have adapted you know now after having been baptized by fire obviously they're employing and utilizing not just bradley's but other western equipment and their equipment also i think they've adjusted their tactics and are doing a much better job now yeah and i think it's interesting to see how successful they you know all of the videos that you you gave me basically they're operating in maybe pairs maybe three but mm -hmm. you know in close proximity maximum there are two bradley's operating i think that's very interesting um not sure if it's just because of scarcity i think that there's also some thought behind it to be honest yeah but uh uh it, it seems to be a lot more successful anyways and they don't lose uh nearly as many bradley's now as they did in the beginning so yeah definitely yeah so we, we yeah, got I a think, question you know go we ahead. got a question to uh it was probably during one of the videos where from nectorn which asks if uh um during one of the videos if they would also employ its machine gun or just a 25 millimeter high explosive shells and i'm assuming that was during one of the engagement i'm not sure when while uh, which one but you can basically give us an answer for when you would uh use the coaxial yeah so the coaxial it's great for infantry um you know you're at close range with infantry it's a great way to engage them with uh, it's got a very high rate of fire it's going to chew them up um you know ob obviously the 25 millimeter is the main gun on it but the thing when a lot of times what you when you would engage with coax would be when you're loading the 25 millimeter um so the bradley carries like 300 rounds in the turret that are loaded you could blow through those 300 rounds as you've seen probably pretty quickly but luckily the bradley also has um about a thousand rounds stored in the rear of the vehicle uh underneath the floor <clears throat> and uh, the coax can be used while loading the 25 millimeter. Um, so if you're in a situation where you have infantry advancing on you while you're reloading, um, the commander could engage with the coax while the gunner is reloading the 25 millimeter. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop this video because it's going towards the end. But uh, we have more questions. Um, I, th I think you guys covered this one a little bit, but uh, Friedman123 asks, like, are the Ukrainians using the Bradleys more aggressively than we would expect from U.S. deployment uh, since we've seen a lot of footage of them going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russian armor uh, at the main line of contact? Uh, so, yeah, if you guys want to elaborate on that. Um, you know, I that's a tough question to answer. If you're using them more aggressively, I don't know. Um, like I said, I think there's kind of a little bit of a scarcity issue going on right now. They're using them well, but I don't think that they're trying to be, you know, more aggressive or, you know, like um, try, trying to be, you know, in an offensive posture with them at the moment. Um, I think they're kind of using them to hold them back and, you know, do limited, you know, maybe limited counter offensives to retake fortifications and stuff. I don't think that they're going to or using them aggressively as, you know, a means of larger counter offensive operations simply because they just don't have enough of them right now um i again I, uh am a firm advocate of getting them more as soon as possible so that they can use them more aggressively um in tandem with other things like we're about to see imminently i think the introduction of f-16s and having that uh you know air superiority added to the docket in your combined arms uh operations 
uh, is going to help you immensely with vehicles on the ground and stuff, because that's going to help mitigate things like the glide bombs that Russia is using massively and uh, just help you overall in general with bringing the uh, air power situation a little bit back more into alignment uh, and peer-to-peer -peer in nature. Gotcha. And then um, a couple of people asked uh, just generally about like airburst rounds. Does the Bradley have airburst rounds? And then also um, someone asked like, does how many different types of rounds does it carry? So I think those kind of go together. Go ahead. Sure. So I don't know if they have airburst rounds. If they, I'm not saying they don't. I hope they do. That would be awesome if they had airburst rounds. Um, I know that when I was in, they were talking about getting airburst rounds. Um, you know. The laser range finder you would have to designate um you know figure out the range that would communicate with the laser range finder and do whatever internal computations to come up to when to detonate but i as far as i know they don't have them um i haven't seen anything that would indicate that they do um there was that those videos where uh, they were shooting kind of elevated into the tree line and i think that, that you know kind of simulate an airburst but uh and then uh, the rounds, uh, they, it carries two types of rounds. It would carry 25 millimeter HE and um, armor piercing. Gotcha. Let me see if there were anyone. Um, someone asked uh, how many radio nets were your Bradleys on? Like, um, how many, like, I, I seem like sort of radio channels because uh, he's saying, like, platoon dismounts company so i think that's what he means right we had two uh we would use like company level and uh squat or company and platoon net for more communications i'm assuming that the ukrainians probably have something along those lines too well yeah so like this is a big issue in ukraine actually when communication is one of the biggest problems that ukrainians are facing and it's probably due to the scaling problem where you know the the ukrainian ground forces are now probably three times or four times as large as they were at the, their largest since 2014 and as you know you know scaling signals that quickly is really difficult uh, also because yeah. it's not the first thing you're going to prototype it's because you need to put men in the trenches and then on the front lines and it's just really, really difficult to prioritize that when you don't, you know, you're really struggling at, at, at the front lines. But they have serious issues on on fielding what is a normal, you know, brigade command net, uh, a comp uh, you know, accompanied by a battalion net, company nets, and platoon nets. That's not something that is normal in Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, but what they do is a lot of ad hoc solutions for communications. And and that's fine, and it's a good you know plug in the gap. But I, there is a lot of problems with communications, and I'm not sure if you know even the 47th has more than two nets available. Um, I would be very surprised if they did, to, to be honest, because that's a thing I read all the time is that they 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 only have the battalion net, and then they might have like a and. A completely different radio set which they bought themselves for you know company and platoon level and that's not ideal because no you're going to run into a lot of different problems yeah I, I would be leery on doing that just because uh it, you know if you're using the radios like in the bradley's or uh singars which are you know encrypted secure you know using stuff like walkie talkies or stuff that they're buying themselves i would be leery about doing that just because the russians you know the enemy could be listening um, well, they're, I mean, good, they're, they're really good at, out of them. They're, they're really good at using encrypted radios, even if they buy them okay. on the civilian market. But, okay. But the problem isn't that they're encrypted or not. It's more that um, when you're operating on a like, uh, so people might not know this, but it's not just like a, a walkie-talkie radio to talking directly to another uh, radio. That's not how it works. So they they talk yeah. through a relay station, which extends the range um of the, of the whole uh so basically you don't need to be in range of the the um, you know the other end which you're talking to you just need to be in range of the relay station and the pro the problem with 
utilizing ad hoc solutions is that yes, you can get relay stations for those as well, um, but that that's not normally how they operate, unfortunately. They just call them amplifiers, but they're really relay stations. You're basically receiving and then retransmitting every single from every single handset or radio uh, that is operating under that net. And yeah, that's a big issue in Ukraine. And I hope that they're with time going, you know, being going to be able to address that. But it's, yeah, you can probably explain how, why that is important in the Bradley, right? Like, why do you need these different nets? Yeah. Uh, so you're going to be communicating, you know, you're, uh, <clears throat> Your, your, their, the operation kind of is broken down to different levels. You know, like let's say you have a battalion uh, level operation. Uh, so you're going to have, you know, battalion communicating with the company or whatever. But, you know, from the internal Bradley crew, um, your platoon net, uh, the communication with your platoon or the smallest, uh, you know, uh, on the hierarchy of that communication tree or hierarchy chart. Um, so you're, you're going to have one on platoon net just to communicate internally with the platoon and then as well as company net to coordinate platoon movements and requests with the company. Um, so, and I know that might be a little bit confusing to some of our listeners, just like the hierarchy chart. So um, uh, you have a platoon, which is made up of a few, uh, you know, three you know, mechanized platoons made up of like three dismount squads and two vehicle sections, which is four vehicles in total. Um, from there in the company, you're gonna have about three platoons, uh, three to four platoons, plus a headquarters element as well. Um, and then at battalion level, you're gonna have four to five companies, yada, yada, yada. But um, the importance of having the two different uh, nets for your communication is being able to communicate firstly with your platoon for you know whatever your platoon needs are and then you know reporting up to hire for uh company level requests like uh medevac cassievac whatever yeah thank you sure yeah i think that's all the questions from chat that i saw erland um if we have any more questions from the panel uh... nope Maybe we can explain why a wheeled platform is inferior to a tracked platform. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, I did see, I think, somebody comment on why the Bradley and not the Striker. And I uh, have experience working close to Strikers. And uh, it always came to pass that the Bradleys had to come and bail them out. Um, they're not as survivable. I don't think uh, they have as thick of armor. Uh, I believe their tires are, you know, of the run flat variety, but still um, you've got a six by six drivetrain, I believe. I think they have three tires on each side. So that's, uh, you know, six different variables of something that could break on it, uh, especially if you're going over terrain. And <clears throat> um, the striker does have an advantage of being faster. It's less maneuverable. It has less firepower. It has less armor. Um, it has less capability going over terrain. Yeah, it could get stuck easier. Maneuver again. I want to go back to maneuvering it because you know a Bradley can do what's called pivot steering, where it could spin 360 degrees on a dime. A striker, you're going to have to do. Uh, I don't know if my European friends are familiar with Austin Powers. There's a scene in it where he's trying to back up a golf cart in a narrow hallway. Um, you know, you have to go forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward multiple times. And you don't want to do that in a peer to peer conflict where you have, you know, drone guided munitions, FPV drones, you know, drone adjusted artillery, rocket fire, whatever. Um, I just don't think that the striker or something wheeled like the BTR has as much useful application in peer to peer conflict just because of its A, maneuverability, B, lack of armor and see greater variables on things that could go wrong, I think, as far as uh, impacting its maneuverability and uh, and other stuff like that. Yeah. I guess maybe closing it out, like uh, you mentioned, like the US is gonna be adopting a new IFV platform, like I guess sort of looking, first off your personal experience operating the Bradley, and then also looking at all this footage in Ukraine um, of them in action, like, 
what would you like to see personally on a new infantry combat vehicle or like the future of infantry combat vehicles? Uh, you seem to be pretty content with the Bradley, but like, what do you think they could improve? Um, one of the things that every member of the Bradley crew from the commander down to, through the gunner down to the driver has requested multiple times when they have done, literally, they would do focus groups. BAE would send focus groups and say, what do you like about the Bradley? What can we do better? What would you like to see? Every single time, the same or one of the first things was a weapon system for the driver to engage with a lot of times especially if the turret is spent you know in a, a <clears throat> spent or you know not facing forward the driver is the first one that sees a threat right so if that you know uh yeah i can go back to situations in iraq where i was a driver you know we i would see you know an insurgent in the road running off the side of the road to engage us with whatever you know rpg detonate an id whatever and if I had the means to engage him, I could have killed him myself easily. But then, you know, you're communicating with the gunner like, hey, shit, there's a guy there. You know, you can't engage or, you know, there's nothing for the driver to engage with. You got to worry about the, uh, the gunner or the BC who didn't see the thing that are going to be trying, you know, trying to engage. So I think the, the first thing I would like to see would be something like a coax that uh, the driver would be able to engage with. Um looking at the modern tempo of the battlefield in the 21st century, obviously drones are a huge issue. Um, we need way more EW or electronic warfare or anti-drone systems. You know, what that looks like, I don't know. Um, could it, you know, be like a mini air defense array on it that has a couple of small rockets to blow up drones, you know, something that shoots a net. I, I don't know what that looks like, but uh, obviously that's cause for concern. Um, I think a little bit more comfortable seating all together between the crews and uh, the dismounts, those benches, especially in the back. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody listening that's ever ridden in the back of a Bradley, but that seventh seat is miserable. <laughs> I, I think they could do a little bit to maybe make it a little bit more pleasant experience to ride and operate in. Um, you know, apart from that, realistically, I... Uh, um would say that's probably it off the top of my head honestly and that, yeah, that would be may, maybe make it change. maybe make it a bit easier to maintain um because it sounded like maintenance yeah kind of pain. you know that would be great i just don't see how um, right <laughs> i i i don't i'm not a mechanic or engineer i don't know how to say you know like hey make this better so that it's easier <laughs> Um, another thing too, I think I just saw in this video was like, you know, like if it had drones itself, I think that would be awesome. Um, you know, maybe seeing like a variant where there, uh, there's a variant of the Bradley called the B fist, which is like for forward observers, artillery guys. And they've got, instead of an area for dismounts in the back, there's like a, like a company commander seat where there's a bunch of computer screens and shit. I don't, I don't really know. I don't have much experience with them. But like ha having a variant like that where you would have maybe one or two drone operators in the back in lieu of dismounts that could launch, you know, FPV drones, you know, uh, you know, uh, bomber drones, what have you, reconnaissance drones, or any me me measure of, you know, future drones. You know, maybe they'll have drones that have actual weapons, you know, systems on them, you know, like guns or something to engage with. I don't know. But, you know, we'll show you the machine like gun that, drone later. Like that. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that, or like a flamethrower drone. I think that'd be pretty cool. That'd, that'd be intimidating. Um, Erlen, didn't they make yeah, a flamethrower drone? I want to say they did. I've it's seen obviously it. not uh, practical, but <laughs> someone did. Make I feel a like someone that did make a flamethrower and kill a lot of Russian with it. I know. On a drone? Uh, that's awesome. Not sure if it was on a drone, but I know someone did make a flamethrower oh. and storm trenchers with it. <laughs> This. That's fantastic. I love the uh, application of a flamethrower. Like one day somebody said, "Like man, I really want to light those sons of bitches on fire," but I'm all the way over here. A Ukrainian <laughs> in a garage with a dream. Yeah. Yes, I love it, dude. Okay, guys. Well, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Smoke. You're absolutely welcome anytime. Uh, we have a good Bradley video you want to show us and talk about, uh, or you want to talk about absolutely. mechanized warfare in general. Um, I think that about wraps it up, Erlen. Is there anything else before we uh, close out? 
Well, no, thank you so much for for you know coming in and and trying to inform the public as much as possible uh, uh, about the Bradley and uh, you know why we should you know why people should advocate for U.S. sending more of them. Uh, I'm not sure how how many is available uh, immediately, but I'm sure there's more, and I, I really hope that there's a bunch of uh, uh, people calling into you know the reps and. Do what you do over That's there in the need. U.S. <laughs> I'm not so familiar. That's what with we you, need, man. With the U.S. political system, but I know people are calling the representatives. I've understood that that much. Yeah, yeah. yeah U.S. listeners, if you are listening uh, right now, yeah, do me a favor. Uh, promise me, you call your representatives when next time you call and uh, tell them that we're not doing enough for Ukraine. You tell them that they need we need to get off our ass and send way more Bradley fighting vehicles. You, you've seen the uh, utility of them. You've seen how devastating they are. You've seen how hard they are to kill. You you know you've seen you know all all these videos. How, they, uh, how well they protect people. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The survivability. Um. You know the Ukrainians need this in their arsenal. They don't need a hundred of them. They don't need you know fifty more to be sent. They need. A large amount of these things so that they could change the tempo on the battlefield they could take the momentum away from russian advances with more bradley fighting vehicles with the f-16s that they're getting to add again like i said to their combined arms doctrine and you know all the other western kit that they're getting but the nut and bolts where the metal meets the meat they need to have way more infantry fighting vehicles and i think again i will pound the table and say that the bradley is the best out of all of them I know I'm biased, and I'm, I know that there are other other great ones too. And I hope that they get more of them. I hope they get more CV90s. But bottom line, guys, call your reps, tell them to send more Bradleys. And uh, everybody here on the Talk Me Stream, thank you so much for having me. Um, I look forward to working with you guys again in the future. Uh, and you know, any any time I could be of service, please let me know. And everybody listening, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this is a first for me. I've never spoken to an audience like this. So uh, thank you. And hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. You found it informative. And if you have any questions or anything, um, just look for that profile pic that you see of me on Twitter. Uh, feel free to ask. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you. Uh, ju just want to point out you did absolutely fine. You did fantastic. It was a, was a great interaction with you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I'm just, you know, throwing up uh, Philip Bionada here. He brought uh, to attention that there already exists uh, at least two different flamethrower drones. So I'm sure the Ukrainians yes. already did this. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, next time, I think, we, you know, maybe we could talk about like uh, main battle tank versus uh, versus uh, IFV platform, because I think that's a discussion to be held as well. Um, we do We do have a tanker. In our crew and I'll, I'll try and you know oops not okay sorry <laughs> we're gonna uh, lure him out of his swedish cave yeah we got a so we have a former 122 commander in our crew as well and uh, uh I'll, I'll i'll you know provoke him by you know uh some stuff from you and then maybe he will he will come on <laughs> awesome i'm looking forward to it guys thank you so much for having me Joseph, okay. I guess you can, you know, give your uh, your outro. Thank you, sir. I guess the picture of the week is a drone with a flamethrower on it that you can probably buy on Alibaba. Um, that's the that's the state of the world that Russia has put us all in, folks. Thanks. Um, but um, yeah, that's uh, that's it for us this week. Uh, it was a great uh, show. We had a lot of a lot of guests, a lot of uh, interesting information. Hope everybody learned something. Uh, we, we did our best to uh, get behind the headlines for you and, and, and talk about a lot of interesting things. Uh, so if you could, please do like the stream. Please do subscribe to Tochni. Uh, we, we broadcast every week at the same time. Uh, so yeah, please do check us out every week. And uh, we'll also have uh, occasional interviews and things uh, outside of that schedule. So uh, if you subscribe, you won't miss anything. Uh, so thanks, everyone uh, who participated on the stream. Thanks to the panel. Thanks so much to our guests uh, for participating and to all the people who contribute on the back end uh, with all sorts of uh, great stuff like graphics and research and other things. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll see everyone next week. Slava Ukraini. Heroi Slava. Heroi Slava.